This week on Sprague Wood Turning, we're going to combine these apple branches with some pearl red tinted resin from Designer Epoxy to make an awesome little bowl. The first thing that we need to do with these branches is trim them up. And these apple branches were sent to me by Ben Noble. Thanks a lot, Ben, for sending these branches to me. Uh, they've been in my kiln now for probably two months, so they're good and dry and ready to be used. So I think I set the bandsaw here at about um, eight inches. And after I kiln dried these pieces, of course, a lot of the bark lifted off of it. Some of it was on there really good, but the majority of it lifted off so you know it's important before you do any of these castings to get rid of all of this bark so that you don't have any adhesion issues so you know i'm just using whatever i've got at hand uh i typically never will use a chisel in this regard because it will dig into the wood so i like to actually use just a flat tip screwdriver it seems to work well and then just a little brass brush in my hand um, handheld drill and that usually does a pretty good job cleaning things up so this piece I needed my big rock and of course these are HDPE clamping blocks that I got off of um, Etsy and you know I'm not going to leave a link for them because you can get them pretty much anywhere but we're just strapping things down so that those branches don't float. This week we're going to be using deep cast from Designer Epoxy. There's going to be in the neighborhood of three liters worth of resin here so we got to make sure that you're using a deep casting epoxy and deep cast from designer epoxy is certainly one of the best like i showed earlier we're going to use some pearl red and uh, that will really show off the areas between the branches and uh, you know i like to mix my pigments pretty heavy so i did that with this piece all right so this is a liter and a half don't have a lot of room to pour this in here so i have to see how this goes anyway i guess you guys aren't going to be able to see anything i probably think this is not going to be enough but i guess we'll see yep we're going to need at least that or more all right so this is another liter and a half and if this doesn't do it then too bad <laughs> i don't want to put any more in there i'm gonna i'm not gonna bother with the fridge I just hope that um, we don't get any thermal cracking. <sighs> wow. So there's about an inch of the branches exposed. I know that you guys can't see that, but that's where we're at. And I'm going to have to leave it there. So I'll put this in the pressure pot. See you guys in there in three days. All right, well, it hasn't quite been 72 hours, but I need this. I got to get this on the go here, so let's hope it's cured. I see the resin has dropped off quite a bit, which I'm a little surprised by because the, uh, the branches aren't rotten. They're actually very, very solid, so still be able to make something cool with it. So, others have been asking we should try and name this rock. So if you've got a name for, for this rock <laughs> that I use for a week, feel free to leave it in the comments down below. Maybe I'll try and do one of them pole things. I haven't done those before. Yeah, so we're going to lose almost two inches of height off of this, which is a bummer, but um, I was really worried about this thermal cracking, and I'm really hoping that it's not. All right, let's see if we can get this out.
Well, I'd say it's hard enough to turn. Yeah, we're going to get some really nice pearl effect in here for sure. Oh, man. If I wasn't so pressed for time, I probably would do another pour, maybe even a contrasting color, but I just don't have the time. Yeah, you can tell it's not fully cured, but you know what? I think it's good to turn. Uh, first things first, uh, we'll try and cut all these branches off. Cutting things that are round on the bandsaw can be tricky. Uh, it can be actually quite dangerous. That is an old rough out, and that's going to prevent this piece from torquing forward when the when the blade goes into it. So, you know, uh, you got to be really careful when you're cutting stuff like this on the bandsaw because the piece, the, the blade can grab the piece and rotate it forward and damage the blade, damage the thing you're working on or damage you. So, um, but this method here has actually felt really secure and I didn't really have any issues at all. And the last step is to use the cut saw sanding disc just to grind down a nice little flat area where we can put our center prior to mounting it on the lathe. The good thing about working resin that isn't fully cured on the lathe is it cuts really quite nicely. Uh, you're not going to get a whole lot of tear out chatter or any of that kind of business with um, resin that isn't fully cured. And you know, this stuff, truth be known, I probably could have finished it. You'll see later on that I give it another day to cure up. But you know, the resin really, really cut nicely. And some people have asked me this in the past, like what is the best time to to basically turn resin projects and and the only advice i can really give you is, is whatever the manufacturer recommends so designer epoxy is 72 hours uh you know at at 60 hours you might be able to get away with it without any issues this was really only 48 hours is all this resin sat for before i mounted it between centers so you know stick with the manufacturer's uh, recommendations I just didn't have the time or else I would have. I should also mention that, of course, we are using the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. That's my go-to uh, carbide tool when it comes to working with these resin and wood combos or resin period. And um, anyway, you'll see the majority of this being done with the Hercules. Every now and then you might see the uh, the 5 bits bowl gouge from David Ellsworth come in. But for the most part, it's pretty much the Hercules. Hercules, uh, and this is another question that I get a lot about the Hercu about Hunter Tool Systems. You know, like if I was going to buy one tool from Hunter Tool Systems, what would it be? It would hands down be the Hercules. I have a lot of the other Hunter Tool Systems tools, but the Hercules is certainly my number one as far as dealing with wood and resin combos for sure. So as you may have noticed, I've switched the piece around and now I'm working on prepping the bottom to get our glue block in place. Uh, I turned a very small tenon on the very top of this and it wasn't exactly really large so I was kind of taking it easy when I was doing that. This is a waste block that's been dipped in hot melt glue and as you can see it's still very hot and there's lots of it. Do not spare the glue. If you do, you're setting yourself up for failure. And it would be a shame to see something like this come apart because uh, you were too cheap to put the 
large amounts of glue on there. Uh, to me, it's just a security thing, and I really don't spare the glue, as you can see, and rarely do I get a failure. And I mean rare. Now that we've chiseled off that little nub, I've got the piece reversed and just truing up the outside of it. Every time you move one of these pieces around, you're going to have to true it up. And, you know, this is uh, this is predominantly the profile that I'm going to stick with. So I said, you know, I'd like to try and get save a piece out of this instead of seeing it all go to waste. Uh, but again, you know, when you're doing these pieces and you're not using tailstock support, you're taking a big risk. Well, you're probably thinking that the glue joint failed, but it didn't. The tenon actually broke. There you go. The tenon broke. There's the other piece. I really wanted to take a piece out of there. It's not going to be very big, but man, I'm worried about getting a catch. Can't use tail, so tail stock support. So I think I'm just going to have to let it be and take out the inside. It was worth a try though. I'm just going to take some CA glue and glue this back on. I suspect that it's the shape of the branches that's causing the, the cutter to catch. And it probably wouldn't be an issue if there was tail stock, tail stock support. I would, I would uh, go ahead and core this out. But I'm worried about it, uh, about bad things happening. <laughs> so anyway, it was worth a shot. To fix this tenon, I'm just going to use some of the Starbond Thin. This stuff actually thickened up a little bit on me, so I had to eventually change that out. And I just kind of hammered the piece down in place to make sure that it was fully seated. And then just filled up all around that little crack, and it held just fine. There was no issues after that. So now that we're not going to be able to save any of the center, I figure, okay, we're just going to drill this out and then um, I'll, I'll move it outboard and then, of course, take out the rest of the center um, later on. Uh, you know, it's a real bummer. I was really hoping to get save a piece out of this uh, and combine it with something else, but, you know, it uh, it just wasn't in the cards. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of guy that typically goes for the sure thing and when that tenon broke off when I was doing that I said okay that's it we're, we're done trying to core this piece because I wouldn't have had a video for this week I'm thinking that I'm going to stop here today uh, I want this resin to harden up a little more before we carry on with doing the inside um, anyway this was worth a shot but it's not going to happen so I'm just going to let this sit overnight, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. So this is the next day and um, so when I put this piece on the lathe the day before if I took my fingernail I could I could you know with some effort push it into the resin and leave a little dent uh, the next day I wasn't able to do that so you know what it's good to go um, the problem with shooting these YouTube videos is you know it takes some time to set up the camera and, and other stuff that you need to do and that's, you know, just getting the project to this point certainly helped considerably as far as shooting the video is concerned and having this ready for, for Friday. Uh, I was just showing that I had put a new cutter on the Hercules 
And you, I mean, you can see, I mean, you're, you're basically taking, this is all in grain and resin. So, you know, uh, this is a very, very tough thing for a high speed steel gouge to do. And this is where carbide tools will be superior over um, gouges and the likes. Three weeks ago, I asked you guys what, you know, you'd like topics you want me to, to cover. And so this week we'll cover wood and where I get my logs from. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of my wood came from people that I met at shows. I'd be doing a show and somebody would come up and say, hey, you know, I've, I've taken down a tree. Are you interested in it? And, you know, for the most part, uh, those are great deals because usually all they're looking for is a bowl or two in return. So, you know, as long as it's close to you and you don't have to go through um, a lot of danger. And what I mean by that, if it's you that's going to take the tree down, if you have the if the if you have the skills to drop that tree safely, um, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But, you know, if it's, you know, for me, if a tree's growing next to a house or between houses and they want me to take it down, forget it. I don't have the insurance um, to do that. And, you know, it's leave that for the professionals to do. And then hopefully you can just come in and load up some logs and be on your way. Uh, another good source, is, of course, is arborists. So check with your local arborists and see what they do with um, the wood you know, the trees that they maintain. A lot of times you might be able to get some really um, neat specimens from them because they, they may be trimming some exotic stuff and not so much just your normal birches and maples and, and you know, this, this kind of business. So along with that, um, in Canada, we have what's called Kijiji, and that is a a buy and sell forum. I'm thinking that it's only in Canada. Maybe it is in the U.S. as well. In the U.S., I'm assuming um, Craigslist would be another common one. U.K., sorry, I have no idea or other parts of the world. I just, I'm just more familiar with North America than anything. And so what I did uh, years ago was I put an ad in Kijiji say that I was looking for cherry, um, walnut, and pearls. And lo and behold, a guy answered it and what he's doing he's he's got he's um they're mainly looking for slabbing wood so the smaller stuff they typically don't want to deal with so it was a great partnership between him and i and i was able to get lots of walnut and um lots of figurative woods from from troy troy is his name and you know it was it was a great great uh thing and i'm really glad that i found troy and so that's another place so Put an ad in, in your local buy and sell and say, this is what I'm looking for. Um, along with that, a lot of people are looking for pearls. And pearls are a tough one to, to come by. In my current location, you know, we've lived here, uh, I think it's 12, 13 years. So people in the area know what I do. And, and sometimes they'll, they'll show up and say, hey, I've got some pearls. Are you interested in them? And a lot of times, you know, if, if, there's, if they got a bunch of pearls, They'll say, look, you can take the bros and just give me one or two back, you know, and finish product. So these are great deals. When there's when there's no money involved, those are the best um, ways to obtain wooden pieces. Along with all of that, I know that um, a lot of sawmills will have burls as well. And it's not maybe what you think where they're bringing burls in to sell them. What happens is, and it really depends on the... Um, the sawmill, the the burls, of course, are like big lumps on the side of the tree. And if you're not familiar with the way that most logging happens, you know, these piece, these trees are cut down and then they're yarded out with skitters. So what can typically happen is a lot of mud and dirt and crap gets packed up against the, the burl. And before it can go through the debarker where they strip the bark off it before it runs through the mill, well, they have to cut that burl off or else the debarker is going to miss a bunch of that stuff. So a lot of times they'll have them laying around in, in waste piles. Uh, I actually contacted a sawmill and, and he told me that, you know, guys were just taking them home and burning them for firewood. So, you know, I was like, well, you can stop doing that right now. I'll take every one that you can get. And I was literally getting these burls by the fulls um, half ton truckload 
when I will go down and see them every, say, three or four months. So it was it was great. Uh, they have switched to a different tree cutting outfit, and now I I believe they're being cut off in the woods, and it's unfortunate that they're probably laying there in the woods. I tried to get that contact information, but he just didn't. Um, I guess he didn't feel like he didn't want to share that info from me. So, you know, it's it's too bad. So that, that again, can be a great source for burls. If you live in a major city, uh, a lot of times there will be log dumps uh, that cities have. And you can come down there and, and I, I don't know exactly how it works. I've just seen them on TV. And, you know, you, maybe you can go down and get a truckload of of logs for next to nothing. Maybe they're free. Maybe they're just giving them away. I, I'm not, I don't really know. By all means, if you live in one of these major centers that have these big log dumps, please, uh, if you can share that with the rest of us, that would be greatly appreciated. And probably the last major source that I can share with you is firewood producers. Uh, in Canada, we, we burn a lot of firewood. So we have a a large number of firewood producers and you might be able to swing a deal where you know you can say look whenever whenever you get some logs and you got burls on them cut them off for me and i'll give you x amount of dollars for them you know even if it's twice as much as what they would get from a um, a cord pricing standpoint it's to their benefit so uh that's probably about the last place that i really truly know that you could get um logs and and burls from uh i've gone down to firewood producers and and just marked an x on certain logs in the pile and then as they got to them they would pull them out and then once the logs were all out and sitting there I'd come down and i would you know i would step up to the plate and, and give them more certainly a lot more than what it would be firewood prices so you know um that is also a great source for logs and burls so before I start sanding, I thought I would show the inside of this. Uh, I know that we haven't really been able to see a whole lot. Uh, that spalted piece of apple branch down there, it's not the same as the others, but that's all right. It'll add a little bit of visual interest. Uh, as you can see, it's cut pretty clean. Shouldn't take too much to do any sanding with it. Same thing here. Little few chatter marks there, but you know what? With the 60 grit, a couple seconds on that, and that is gone. All right, let's start uh, doing some sanding. These are the three and a half inch dipple discs from sandpaper.ca, and there is a link in the description to 10% off your next order. Just use code inlaygem at checkout. So that's how I get typically my would uh but again the the longer that you're in business doing this the the more contacts you're going to make and eventually you'll be in a position where you've got too much of it and so you're going to have to buy the expensive stuff like walnut and cherry and burls typically uh but you know a lot of times you can end up with a lot of free maple and birch uh which still make fantastic pieces so if you've got anything to add to that, I would certainly love to hear it, uh, how you get your, your pieces of wood, your burls, uh, if you can share that knowledge with us, the other, you know, other than something that I haven't covered, that would be fantastic and I would really appreciate it. This is another question that I get asked a lot, you know, sanding speeds and, you know, this is a real time clip. So I left this in here so that you can kind of see how fast I'm moving across the surface of the inside of this bowl. Uh, but, you know, typically, you know, I'll, I'll sand at around a thousand. That's that's probably where I'm sanding in most cases. So now we're all done sanding to 800. That's typically all I ever go to. This is the buffing compound, triple E buffing compound from the be all buffing system. Uh, the pad is a little too large to get right into the very base, but it was okay. It's mostly wood down there. I do switch to a smaller pad when I put on the second coat of finish. 
and it's important to clean off any of that buffing compound with the denatured alcohol prior to the finish going on. That way the buffing compound doesn't mess with it. All right, so this week, just like last week, we're gonna use the Waterlux Original Gloss. This piece will no doubt take three coats. There is a lot of ingrain here, so I suspect that that will, uh, we'll have to use three coats, but we'll see. I am 100% totally happy with the Waterlux products. Since switching to them, I've noticed that I'm probably not putting on near as many coats. It covers extremely well. And you know, I am not affiliated with them. They're, they're not a cheap finish, but you know, it is one of these things you, you get what you pay for. And I highly recommend the Waterlux line of finishes. Check out that pearl. Very, very cool. Definitely be doing more of these in the future. Not an easy thing to sand, a lot of end grain. Tool work is important. Uh, but if your tool work is good, then you know what? You probably shouldn't have too many issues. All right, I'll let this dry overnight and we'll see you tomorrow. For the new people that are here, before I put on the next coat of finish, I always use the Triple E buffing compound again. And as you can see, I've got the smaller uh, buffing pad on my drill. That way I can get down and do the whole piece. And again, cleaning with the denatured alcohol, very, very important. Good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux Original Gloss. All right, well, there's the second coat. It has covered really well, and maybe only two coats will do it. We will find out tomorrow when I have a look at it. Anyway, if, the, if it does need another coat, I will do it the same way as I did the second coat. I love that pearl. And um, if not, we'll see you when we're doing the foot. All right, so before we use the vacuum chuck, I thought I would go over this again. This is another very, very common request, how this vacuum chuck is set up. So you have to have a hollow arbor. This is the one-way setup. I bought the whole setup completely from one way, including the vacuum pump that you see down there. And so what happens is, uh, this is the medium size. You can get a larger drum. These are solid aluminum, very, very great construction. And you get these from one way. So there's a larger one than this and then a smaller one than this, which I intend on getting both of them here very shortly. And whatever size adapter you'll need, you can get from one way as well to fit your lathe. So it comes through. This is the part that screws on to the inboard side. In most cases, you people that are right-handed, which is the majority of you, this is gonna be reversed. So that is going to be on this side and your chuck is going to be on the inside. And the great thing about that is you can use your tailstock when you're doing the vacuum system. But for me, being left-handed, it's more convenient that it's on the outside. So then this is on a bearing. So it free spools just like so. That comes down to a gauge assembly. And when it's in this configuration, it's drawing air through here. When you close it, that creates a vacuum. And then once you've reached, you know, typically I'm about 25 inches of vacuum when I'm um, using the system. And once you've got that, then you know you're good to go. Uh, that is a marathon, we've got here, quarter horsepower is what that is. And um, anyway, it's a great system, really love it. So yeah, when it's in this, configuration then of course you've got uh, vacuum and then when you want to re release the vacuum just lift up on the handle 
while of course you're holding on to whatever's here or else it's going to go whoop, flying, which you don't want. Anyway, that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's not real complicated, but man, is it handy to have. All right, let's do the bottom on our, uh, our beautiful little bowl. So if you're right-handed, of course, like I said earlier, this is going to be reversed. So what you could do is find the center on that waste block and then bring up your, your tailstock and put it right on the center of that and then bring it up onto the, the uh, vacuum chuck, turn the vacuum on, and then in theory, everything should be centered. So, you know, that's the benefits of being right-handed and working inboard um, as opposed to being outboard like I am. Um, so I'm going to be using pretty much everything here. The 5 8 wool gouge, the Hercules, the Osprey. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Just to turn in this foot, uh, this is a truly elevated foot. And a um, little bit... Um, I, never, I realize the footage is going by here really fast. I mean, I've got to, I've got to keep this sped up footage because it, if I didn't, these videos would be hours long. But there was a little branch in there that was uh, quite soft, and it left a little indent. I was trying to get rid of it, couldn't, couldn't do so. So you know, it's, it's one of those things that you know, you, sometimes you just gotta live with what Mother Nature has given you. One of the great things about working outboard is, of course, you don't have a lathe bed in front of you. So you can stand directly in front of the work and not be bent over trying to look inside of a, a bowl or whatever you're working on. So I see that as a major, major benefit. I know that probably most don't, but I do. All right, let's have a last little chat about this week's project. All right, so before we talk about this week's project, I want to show you some stuff that Ben sent along. So this is a keychain that's made from apple wood, but it has a secret compartment inside of it. So you can roll up some cash, stick it in there, and uh, that way if you ever, you know, you can leave it as an emergency fund if you will. So that was very cool. Thanks a lot for that, Ben. I really appreciate it. There was certainly no, no need for you to do that. And he also sent me a stainless steel tumbler insert for me to play with. So uh, this is something I've never done before. Um, so anyway, thanks a lot for sending that along. There was absolutely no need for it, but I certainly do appreciate it. So thanks again. All right, so this week's project. I gotta tell you, I'm in love with this thing. Uh, we're gonna see more of these in the future. I don't know how many applewood ones we're going to see in the future but we certainly see it made with other types of branches very very cool uh there is no finish on the bottom it is signed and ready to go you know it's it, the signature is there but it's going to probably take two or three coats on the very bottom uh, i'm out of time it's late thursday and i still get a bunch of editing to do and so that's why there's no finish on here uh very very fun project to do uh, right on the very bottom, I'll point this out right here. And one of these branches was actually kind of soft. So it's a little, um, little indented there. That happens more than you may think that it did. Actually, I think it happened on uh, two weeks ago. It was a project there too. So, you know, you gotta be careful when you're working with this stuff. Uh, it looks solid to me, but it must've been just a little bit softer than the surrounding pieces of wood and the resin. So that's what happens. But an awesome, awesome project. I should say that this is eight inches across and five and a half inches tall. And it was really fun to do. Uh, and this piece is for sale. So I'm not gonna disclose the price here in case it's a gift. Uh, I will say that it's, it's on the higher end of the scale, but this is a really, really beautiful decorative object. And thanks again, Ben, for sending along those branches. I really do appreciate it. All right, so next week we were going to be doing this 65,000 subscriber giveaway bowl. We're not there yet, but at the shooting of this video, but I'm pretty sure that by the time next week rolls around, we should have that, um, that count. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, subscribing to my channel and supporting my channel. And um, 
And of course, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing that. And of course, that thumbs up will always help with the analytics, even a thumbs down, believe it or not. So thumbs up or thumbs down, it helps with the analytics. I guess it shows YouTube that you're engaged in the channel and you're, you know, we're interacting. All right, well, that's it. Till next week, take care, stay safe. Don't forget that bell. And if you're interested in this piece, send me an email, spraguewoodturning at gmail.com. See you next week.